The function of the respiratory system includes, of course, providing tissues for gas exchange between the air and the bloodstream. Every animal needs gases to help them do aerobic respiration, and we're definitely one of them. We need oxygen gas being supplied to our tissues all throughout our life, um, especially the ones that are working really hard, like our muscles and our brain, of course. So having uh, that tissue for getting gas into the body effectively and getting rid of the gas that's waste, that's very important. And along with that, the action of moving air in, uh, the inhalation or inspiration, and moving air out of the body, uh, exhalation or expiration. That's very important as well. It's a part of it. Also, the lungs, etc., protect the body from dehydration, temperature fluctuations, the entrance of pathogens. It's not, of course, just the lungs. It's a lot of the upper respiratory uh, parts, and in addition to the lower respiratory parts, are participating in this. Uh, dehydration, the losing of fluids, it doesn't just happen through sweat. Uh, you could lose fluids out of this passageway. After all, it is an entrance exit into the body. Uh, the temperature fluctuations, uh, you don't want um, to have cold air coming in. Let's say you were in a very cold part of the earth. Um, you know, you're, you're in the Arctic and you're breathing in air that is <laughs> below freezing. Um, uh, that would be harmful to your body. So every time you breathe in air, your respiratory tract is warming that air and moistening that air so that's not as harsh to your body. And of course, the entrance of pathogens, you don't want bacteria and viruses that you're inhaling to constantly invade your cells. So the majority of that stuff that the average person inhales is not going to attack their tissues because the respiratory tract and, and respiratory system is defending your body. And of course, producing sounds, vocalization. I'm doing it right now. Uh, when I expel air across my, my vocal cords and I manipulate them in addition to uh, my mouth, tongue, etc., you're going to hear speech. So when it comes to uh, the breakdown of what's in the respiratory tract, uh, we can look at it at the up, upper respiratory tract and then the lower respiratory tract. So the upper respiratory tract uh, is going to include everything from the nose down to the throat. And so if we start with uh, our first slide here, we're going to be with the external nares. And, and that is a fancy term for nostrils. So these are my external nares. The hole that actually leads into that opening into your respiratory tract, we can call the vestibule. And, and vestibule basically means like entrance or doorway. And there are other parts of the body where the term vestibule is used. Uh, so here, you know, the actual holes in my nostrils, that entrance is called the vestibule. The nasal septum, um, septum is a term used in other parts of the body as well, like there's a septum in your heart that separates, uh, for instance, the two ventricles from each other. And in this case, the nasal septum is separating the two sides of your nasal cavity, uh, where your nostrils are, and the nasal conchae. The nasal septum is partially cartilaginous, so right here in blue, this is soft bone. This is cartilage of your nasal septum, and then a little bit further back, a little uh, uh, posterior slash slightly uh, superior, you can see that this is bony. It's the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Uh, that's the, a good portion of your bony nasal septum straight back here. And then just inferior to that is the vomer bone. And then the palatine bone is another part of it. Um, so a few different bones make up the bony nasal septum. This particular image is great uh, from Gray's Anatomy. It's a, just a perfect sagittal cross section straight through the middle of uh, this nasal region. And then of course the nasal conche. If we were to look at other parts uh, on the sides or, or lateral to this uh, septum, the nasal conche are those twist and turns of mostly the ethmoid bone. Uh, there are a couple other bones involved, but the uh, ethmoid bone uh, is the majority of that, that twisty, turny uh, passageways leading air into the body. And along that, you're going to have the production of lots of mucus. And the mucus serves many purposes. One of them is catching dirt, catching bad stuff before it gets deeper and causing infections. When you're sick, you're going to produce a lot more mucus, uh, and that makes sense. Upper respiratory tract, number two. So if we, if we keep looking at this area in the, uh, the upper part of the respiratory system, the nasal mucosa is um, mainly in the nasal conche region. But the reason why I'm listing it here is as you breathe air in and it ends up going down into the, the throat or the pharynx, uh, 
The nasal mucosa not only is catching bad stuff, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, that you're you know, breathing in, it also warms the air and moistens the air. Very important so it's not as harsh to your lungs. If you think about it, um, the, the air in this room right here and, and possibly where you're at um, on Celsius scale is probably low 20s, 20 to 22 degrees Fahrenheit scale, you know, 70 to low 70s. And that's room temperature. But your body temperature, Fahrenheit, 98 point something. Some people it's 98.6, 98.2, what have you. That's a big difference. So when you breathe in air, it warms it a bit, gets it close to your body temperature so it's not as harsh to your lungs. And of course, uh, the moistening of air, very important too. You can say that the nasal mucosa humidifies the air, adds moisture to it as you're breathing it in. The pharynx, also known as the throat, we can separate into three different parts. And here they are from top to bottom, superior to inferior. The nasopharynx uh, is, is the part of the throat that's adjacent to that nasal cavity or nasal conche that you can see in here. So here are those, or at least a part of those little twist and turns of the ethmoid bone. And so that nasopharynx region is the connection where every time you swallow, you're going to get a little bit of mucus drainage. I know it's nasty, but that mucus drainage is going to go down your throat. And, and that's great in terms of protecting your body. If you're catching bacteria and viruses in the mucus of your nasal cavity, a great way to like finally kill it is when you swallow it and it goes down your throat, down your esophagus, into your stomach, the acidity of your stomach is usually enough to destroy those things. The oropharynx, oro coming from oris or mouth, oral, that's the area of the pharynx that's adjacent to the tongue. So this is the tongue, kind of a, a weird looking tongue, but that's how it looks when you have a sagittal cross section and, and it's inside the mouth. That's what the tongue looks like. And right here, that's called the soft palate. The um, most posterior or dorsal part of the palate is, is actually soft compared to the hard palate. And so the part of the throat that's adjacent to there, I mean, as you're eating something, swallowing something, that's going to be passing through there. You also can breathe through the mouth. Um, really, your nose is meant for that. Uh, if you've done a lot of mouth breathing, you've probably noticed that it tends to dry out the mouth over time. And you're also not going to get that really good um, uh, humidifying of the air that you get with breathing in through the nasal region. So that's the oropharynx. And finally, the most inferior part, the laryngeopharynx, because the larynx is right there. So here we have, uh, it's kind of like a, a fork in the road. Posterior passageway here, that is the esophagus. So when you do drink fluids, uh, swallow, like I just did, um, swallow food, for instance, it's gonna go down the esophagus. This is the larynx, and right here is the epiglottis. That's going, that's a flap that's going to close on top of this passageway so that when you do swallow, you don't want fluid and, and, and food going down into your lungs. That could cause you to aspirate and cause you to uh, stop breathing and kill a person. So the laryngeopharynx is that, that lowest part of the throat that's adjacent to the larynx. So when we look at the larynx, um, there are several parts involved, and, and that's you know this part right here. You know, we, we say voice box, we're talking larynx, but there's more to it than that. If we start at the most superior part of the larynx, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the epiglottis, uh, which is right above the glottis, that's what that epi means, you know, being uh, above something. Every time you swallow, the epiglottis flaps down. It, it's, it's a flap that, that closes on top of the glottis, and the glottis is the opening into the larynx passageway. Uh, every time you swallow, that epiglottis is supposed to flap down, and the glottis is supposed to close so that fluid and, and solids are not going into the larynx and the trachea, your, your windpipe leading to the lungs. And we'll talk more about the glottis in a bit with respect to uh, the vocal folds or vocal cords. Uh, the cartilage, there's a lot of cartilage involved with the larynx. Um, real quick, before I move on, the epiglottis is this structure right here. This is a uh, cross-section, once again, a sagittal cross-section to the larynx. It's like we're looking uh, from the side view. So this is the epiglottis when it's not closed. So every time you swallow, it does close. So this person is not swallowing currently. You can't see the epiglottis in this shot, but if it were raised, you would see it poking out um, next to what's called the hyoid bone right there. Uh, so that would be where the epiglottis is. 
the glottis is just um, inferior to it. And, and you'll see a picture on the next slide of it. That's right in this region here. The cartilage, um, lots of cartilage going around, soft bone that's, that's protecting uh, your throat, protecting your airway. The thyroid cartilage is the most prominent one. Um, the Adam's apple, if you've heard of that term, we're referring to what's called the thyroid cartilage. I'm gonna do that in red. So here is the thyroid cartilage. And from that side view, if you were to you know, take a cross section through it, we're seeing uh, part of the thyroid cartilage right here. So that is that typical looking Adam's apple that everyone has, not just men. You know, people say, oh, a man has an Adam's apple and a woman typically doesn't. Well, a woman has all these structures as well, uh, but an adult female, because of differences in sex hormones, it's typically not as visible. Um, as a male goes through puberty, the size of the vocal folds and, and the larynx is, is, in, in general is going to become more visible. Um, the vocal folds especially are gonna get broader and larger and, and that's gonna have an effect on their voice. Your, your voice tends to drop uh, when you age, you know, go through puberty. And uh, female voice changes a bit too, but not as dramatically in terms of the octave shift. So that thyroid cartilage, uh, a major uh, component in protecting the larynx, and that part that's most obvious right here that's sticking out, that's called the laryngeal prominence. It's a very prominent uh, part of the larynx. And then the cricoid cartilage is just inferior to that. That's number seven here. Here's the cricoid cartilage. Uh, here it is in this uh, little view. And in between those two cartilages, there's a ligament. Uh, there's another ligament right here. Uh, this is actually the laryngeohyoid ligament because it's connecting um, this part of the larynx to the hyoid bone, which I'm going to mention next. So the hyoid bone is an interesting bone because, to my knowledge, it's the only bone that I can think of that does not articulate with any other bones in the body. It is, it is not directly touching any other bones. And, and if you think about how bones work, typically bone is next to bone um, in a joint, whether it's a fused immovable joint or immovable joint. But in this case, the hyoid bone is up here. I'm touching it right now. And it's held in place uh, by muscles, ligaments, tendons. It's not actually touching any other bones. It's very close to the mandible, the lower jaw bone, but it's not quite touching it. And the purpose of the hyoid bone is, is once again, like these other things, partially protective, but also uh, it's for anchoring parts of the throat muscles and the tongue um, that helps in swallowing. So that's the hyoid bone. And then ligaments, I already mentioned some of them, ligaments here, ligaments here, um, ligaments all over the place. And remember, ligaments uh, connect bone to bone or cartilage to bone. And then the vocal cords. You'll see a better view of the vocal cords on the next slide. If you look down into uh, the throat and look at the top of the larynx, like through, let's say, a, um, a little camera, as someone is talking, uh, you can see there's slight little vibrations going on as air is expelled past the vocal cords. And depending on how they vibrate uh, and the structure of those vocal folds, that's going to give you different pitches and different sounds. So sound production. Air passing through the glottis, the open glottis, vibrates the vocal folds and produces sound waves. This is a great view. This is an actual camera shot uh, looking down in, in, into someone's, uh, the top of their larynx and through the pharynx. And the glottis is this opening. The epiglottis, which you can't see in this particular image, is actually uh, right in front of it. And it's currently not down because this person is expelling air. This person is talking. When you swallow, remember the epiglottis does uh, close over this opening. The, here's the anterior part. This is the, the front part. The posterior part is actually uh, down this way. Diameter, length, and tension of these vocal folds, the vocal cords, changes the pitch. So here are the vocal uh, folds right here. You know, if we were comparing uh, the average male, adult male, average adult female, typically the diameter and length is going to be larger in an adult male uh, compared to the female. What we have control over is the tension. Depending on how tense we make them, uh, that's going to change pitch. So if I go, I am actually changing the tension. I'm making the vocal folds thinner 
But if I go, I'm making them wider. And if you uh, play a stringed instrument or play the piano, you're familiar with this. On a guitar, uh, the particular strings that make the lower uh, pitch notes, those are thicker strings. And the, and the really ding, 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 those uh, other <laughs> strings that actually do that, the higher pitch ones, they're, they're thinner. And it's the same with the piano. Uh, remember, piano's hammers hitting strings. The ones at the far right end, they're going to be thinner than the really low notes at this end. And so that's how it works in terms of making different pitches. And like I said before, in general, adult males have thicker, longer chords compared to a female. Uh, but there, are, of course, are exceptions. That's a generalization. Speech, what I'm doing right now, is a combination of phonation, just making sound, and articulation, actually making different types of specific noises and specific um, manipulations of that sound. So phonation is just the process of expelling air as, as I'm exhaling, as, I, as I'm expelling air past the vocal folds in this glottis region. But articulation is when you take that sound and do what I'm doing right now. Movements of the mouth, lips, and tongue are going to manipulate that sound to make speech that's audible and understandable to somebody. Um, if I didn't have my tongue, uh, I could not make a wide variety of noises uh, or, or, or letter sounds. So a T, when you make a T sound, there's a very specific movement that your tongue has to make to, t -t -t to make that T sound. If my tongue wasn't there, I'd still have the phonation ability, but my articulation would not be there. Trachea. Uh, so we are now into the lower respiratory tract. Remember that the upper respiratory tract is from the nose to the pharynx. We just started the lower respiratory tract with the larynx, and we're definitely in the lower parts here. So the trachea, if you follow the, the path of your larynx, right here, I'm actually uh, touching part of the trachea. Um, if I press in, not, not too much, because I don't want to you know, suffocate myself, but if I press in a little bit, I can feel little rings here. And as I'm talking, I can actually feel uh, vibrations, air going up here and then through the vocal cords, etc. So the, the other parts of the trachea, you can't feel because it goes behind the manubrium, these parts of the sternum. Um, but you can touch this part. And actually, this is where they, they would do a uh, uh, tracheostomy or tracheotomy um, to uh, bypass the upper re respiratory tract to help someone breathe. And I'll talk about that more in a sec. But the trachea is known also as the windpipe. This is that tube that's getting air into the lungs. It is a tough, flexible tube with cartilaginous rings. And you can see those rings, as I mentioned a second ago. I could feel them if I, if I rub right here. Those cartilaginous rings are kind of C-shaped, um, but pointing this way. Because the posterior or back portion is really not covered with cartilage in the sense that the anterior uh, portion is. Um, and the reason behind that is, if you remember from the previous slide, the esophagus is behind it. The esophagus is that food tube or liquid tube that's posterior to this. So every time you swallow and, and a chunk or bolus of food is being moved down your esophagus, you want slight flexibility for your trachea to, to kind of accommodate that. So there's slightly less cartilage in the posterior portion so that there is a little bit uh, more flexibility when you do swallow something. So it is slightly flexible, not as much as these uh, more posterior parts of the respiratory tree. We're going to get to that in a bit. Respiratory epithelium. So if you watched the previous lessons on uh, the different types of tissues in the body, what epithelium is, epithelium, a reminder, is those cells that cover the outer surface of an organ or the innermost surface, usually where there's a passageway, a lumen for, for air, liquids, foods to go through. In this case, air is passing through every time you breathe in, every time you exhale, uh, air is going back and forth. And the respiratory epithelium, if you were to zoom in to what's going on in the innermost part, the lumen of the trachea, and then the lumen of the entire respiratory tree, you would see cells that are filled with cilia. And these cilia look like hairs. It kind of looks like a shag carpet. Uh, my grandmother's house, the house she used to live in, had a green shag carpet, very 70s. And really, cilia looks like that. And they're constantly brushing up mucus, constantly. If you didn't have those cilia bringing mucus generated from down here up and out, up into the throat, you could drown in, in the fluids that are produced in the lungs. Every time you hakalugi, 
that that's where that loogie, that spit is coming from. Um, yes, yeah, some of it is saliva, but um, you know, we, we, we experience that when we have a cough, when we are sick and there's excess mucus production, we really do notice what those cilia are doing. People who smoke tend to destroy the cilia lining, these passageways, and we don't typically regenerate them. So when you lose the cilia, you don't get them back. And that's why somebody who's a chronic smoker smoking for years is more likely to get pneumonia, an infection associated with basically uh, too much pooling of fluids in the respiratory passageways. Uh, but a healthy person is able to get um, those fluids up and out. And the mucosa here in the trachea resembles that of the more superior structures. Um, the production of mucus here is, is very similar to uh, what you're going to see in, in, in the mucosa of the nasal passageways and into the pharynx. When we go a little bit more inferior, we get to the bronchi and the bronchioles. Bronchioles basically means miniature or tiny bronchi. So this is plural, the word bronchi. A bronchus, uh, we would replace the I with a U-S, is one of them. So here, right here on this picture, is one bronchus. Here's the other bronchus. And these are actually called the primary bronchi. Primary bronchus on the right, and this is the left primary bronchus. So there is one for each lung. Um, this is an anterior shot. We're looking through the chest of this person. So even though this is on your left, this is where the right lung is. This is where the left lung is. So right primary bronchus, left primary bronchus. And it goes in sequence from primary to secondary to tertiary. As I said, this is the primary one. These in here would be your secondary bronchi branching off of it. And then you get into your tertiary bronchi. Uh, so it is like a branching tree that's upside down. And they do get smaller diameter as you move along, and they have less and less cartilage. By the time you get to what are called the bronchioles, which are branching off of all of these tertiary bronchi, you're not going to have any cartilage at all. Uh, and, and the purpose of that is as you move through and, and you get less and less cartilage, you're able to expand and, and contract those passageways more. The cartilage isn't um, kind of inhibiting it. And that's good in terms of like getting more air or less air into your lungs when the need is there. And yes, smooth muscles are lining the bronchi and bronchioles. Uh, and those smooth muscles, especially at the, the deepest parts, especially at the, um, the ends, are going to allow for um, dilation and contraction of these passageways. The bronchioles, as I said, are like little tinier branches that are coming off of the tertiary bronchi. The tiniest little branches leading to the leaves, and the leaves, if we're going to continue that analogy of a tree, would be the alveoli coming up in the next slide. Um, with the little drawings I'm making here, I'm not even doing it justice. There are so many bronchioles. And like I said before, the cartilage that you see, these little uh, grayish rings, you can see they get reduced and reduced as you get into the tertiary bronchi. When you get to the bronchioles, no cartilage. And you're having a, a much thinner tube. Um, you've got that respiratory epithelium still in there. And you have a greater um, degree percentage-wise of expansion and relaxation or dilation and uh, contraction. When I said expansion and relaxation, that's actually the same thing. It's, it's dilation and uh, contraction or constriction. So here are the proper terms, bronchodilation versus bronchoconstriction. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, manipulating your blood vessels, it's known as vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So here we just replace that prefix with something that corresponds to the lungs. Bronchodilation is the expansion of bronchioles and other passageways in the lungs and bronchoconstriction is the opposite. Bronchodilation tends to be associated with the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Um, that came up in uh, nervous system lessons from before, that fight or flight response. You wanna get more volume of air into your lungs with each breath. When you're relaxed and in the you know rest and digest or uh, parasympathetic mode, um, that's gonna be more associated with the uh, bronchoconstriction. The alveoli, like I mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, those are the leaves, in a sense, on this respiratory tree. And they're the air sacs within the lungs. It's like the final destination uh, for the air flowing through your respiratory tree. 
So these air sacs, this is a nice animation of what they look like. Here's a little alveol alveolar bundle, and each of these is an alveolus. So this little sphere, alveolus, alveolus, alveolus. They are one cell thick. So if you take a cross section through one of these microscopic air sacs, you would see that, that they're all just surrounded by one cell thick. And so here's one cell, here's one cell with a nucleus, one cell. That's a single alveolus. And inside there, that's the lumen. That is the, the space where air can travel into. Uh, and this is made of simple squamous epithelium, which came up in that tissues lesson from before. Just like capillaries, the smallest blood vessels of your body being one cell thick, these are also one cell thick. And this is very interesting right here when we look at the red and the blue, that's a capillary network, capillary network surrounding the alveolar bundles. And it's great that air only has to pass through two cells. It passes through uh, the, the cells of the simple squamous epithelium around this alveolus, and then it goes into the capillary. And, and the wall of that capillary is also simple squamous epithelium, and so you have very adequate diffusion. Think of if it was like 10 cells thick, it would be harder for air to travel through. Uh, it wouldn't happen as quickly and as efficiently. Each lung has approximately 150 million alveoli. So about 300 million alveoli in your lungs as a whole. Uh, that's amazing to think about. And these are very tiny air sacs. Um, people who tend to smoke tend, tend to damage these little uh, borders between the alveoli. They tend to pop them and make the holes bigger. The space is bigger in, in their spongy lungs. And you might think, well, if they make the spaces bigger, oh, that's great. Then they can get more air in there. It doesn't work that way. Um, you want to have a, a large surface area, um, meaning having lots of different tiny bubbles or tiny alveoli is going to make it more efficient in terms of getting a lot of air into your bloodstream um, rather than having bigger holes. So that surface area is very important. I've, I've read that if, this is an approximation, if you take all the alveolar um, parts, all the alveolar uh, membranes, the simple squamous epithelium, and if you were to like take them out of a body and lay them out like little tiles, it would cover a tennis court. That's amazing to think about, that that, that tissue is in your lungs. So like I said before, every alveolar bundle is surrounded by a capillary network, which you see in this picture. Um, that capillary network is getting oxygen into uh, the bloodstream and getting CO2, carbon dioxide, into the alveoli uh, for um, expiration or uh, exhalation, getting it out of the body. Also, you see these little green little uh, lines. The green parts is the lymphatic vessels, lymphatic tissue, which has to do with protecting your body, your immune system. Uh, so you do have this great um, kind of security checkpoint in a sense, so that if if viruses or bacteria get through the upper respiratory tract all the way through down to the bottom of your respiratory tree, you have this last line of defense before something enters your bloodstream to deal with it and take care of it. And also with this little cross section, if you were to look really closely what's going on there, you would see macrophages, um, giant white blood cells that eat up bacteria and viruses, you would see them kind of patrolling along and sitting there waiting for something to come by and eating it up. Uh, so people with uh, an adequate immune system, a strong immune system, are going to be doing a great job with their lymphatic tissues here, um, kind of screening the air, kind of getting rid of that bad stuff that's coming in. Surfactant is the last thing I want to mention with respect to these alveolar bundles. Surfactant um, is a chemical that's a combination of um, uh, phospholipids and protein that has to do with reducing uh, the, the, the surface tension. So if it wasn't for surfactant, your alveolar sacs would tend to collapse. We don't want that to happen. Um, surface tension is a good thing because it has to do with um, getting stuff out of the air into water. And, and we want to get stuff out of the air, specifically oxygen, into the fluids of the body, into um, through the alveolar wall and into our capillaries. But if the surface tension is too high, these little uh, bubbles, you can think of them as being like little bubbles in the air. Uh, they would collapse. They would cease to be how they should be. So surfactant is this secretion um, right next to that, that liquid part of it. 
that helps keep the alveoli expanded properly so that we can continue to breathe air. Now, if you don't have enough surfactant, the little uh, air sacs could collapse. And the problem, one of the many problems with uh, some premature babies is if they're born very early on in the third trimester, let's, let's say they're two and a half, three months premature, not only are their organs in general underdeveloped and, and they're very small weight and they tend to lose heat fast, there's a lot of factors um, that are a problem, but the amount of surfactant that that baby has produced is not nearly what it should be when they're born. Um, so they actually will um, supplement their, their little premature body with surfactant so that their lungs can, can maintain um, the, the alveolar um, integrity in terms of them um, being expanded enough to continue to get air into the body. The lungs as a whole, uh, these spongy uh, organs that, that have that respiratory tree inside of them, the right lung, has three lobes, it's a bit bigger than the left lung, which has two lobes. And once again, this is an anterior or ventral shot. Uh, here is this person's right lung, here's this person's left lung. And you can see there's this little indent here where the heart should be. Um, so that, that little um, nook right there is where the heart is, is nestled. So that is why the left lung is a little bit smaller to accommodate the heart. And if you count the lobes, yes, there's one, two, three here, one, two for the left lung. There are deep fissures, little, little borders between the lobes. Right here is a horizontal fissure. Here's an oblique fissure, a diagonal one. Here's another oblique fissure. The right lung is a bit broader, left lung longer, um, ever so slightly. So if you were to look at the right lung, it is a bit wider. The left lung, a tad bit longer and the reason why is if you look at where the liver is situated the liver is more on the right side of your upper abdominal cavity so the left lung is a, doesn't go down quite as far to accommodate the liver which is right here of course the border between um, the thoracic cavity where the lungs are and the abdominal cavity is something called the diaphragm i'm going to mention more about that in a bit uh, the spongy appearance and the spongy consistency of the lungs is because of the alveoli. All of those microscopic air sacs scattered around um, adjacent to the, the ends of those bronchioles is going to make it have that spongy look and feel. And the lungs are surrounded by membranes. So there are two membranes. Each of them are plural membranes. Not plural like more than one, but pleura. The pleura you have two of them. One of, one of the membranes is directly on the lungs, then there's a liquid layer between them, and then there's pleura uh, on the inside of your thoracic uh, wall or the thoracic cage where the ribs are. Speaking of pleura, like I said, they're the membranes that surround and protect the lungs. It's two layers. So the parietal pleura, on this particular image, they call it the uh, costal pleura because remember if you saw the uh, the lesson that has to do with the ribs and and the um, axial skeleton the costal uh, term means ribs so the, the uh, muscles between the ribs it's called the intercostal muscles there's costal cartilage which is right in here uh, you can use that term too so whether you call it costal pleura or parietal pleura it's adjacent to the inner thoracic wall and the diaphragm which is the muscle right below the lungs or inferior to the lungs. The visceral pleura is the one that's right on the surface of the lungs. So that is adjacent to the, uh, the more superficial part of the lungs. We can call that the pulmonary pleura. Remember the word pulmonary, this happened, uh, we went over this in the heart lessons uh, or blood vessel lessons. Pulmonary always has to do with the lungs. So instead of using the term visceral pleura, you might see it called pulmonary pleura in certain textbooks. So what's the deal here? Not only is it protecting the lungs, but that liquid that's in between. So you can see that this black region is the cavity that the two pleural membranes forms. And over here, it's actually adjacent to the pericardium, that sac surrounding the heart. What's the purpose? Well, it helps keep the lungs elastic. If the amount of pressure that's, that's inside of this plural region were, were to be changed, it would change the ability of the lungs to expand and contract adequately. For instance, let's say there was a hole. Uh, it's called a pneumothorax. If a hole was in 
uh, one of these membranes and, and air could leak in or out, um, you could get a collapsed lung. Even if it's a tiny, tiny uh, hole or puncture. Uh, so that just goes to show you that there is an importance um, to have that e e elasticity uh, remain adequate. Uh, and it's also lubrication. Um, just like with the, uh, the fluid that's inside the pericardial sac for the heart, the fluid around the lungs, it's like keeping it a well-oiled machine. You, you are expanding and relaxing your lungs all throughout the day, every day of your life. Uh, so not only is it helping to maintain the elasticity of the lungs, but it's also uh, for lubrication because they're, they're moving constantly. So the breathing mechanism, how do we actually physically breathe? The diaphragm has a lot to do with it. So right under the lungs, so let's say here are the lungs. Underneath there, you're gonna have this dome-shaped uh, muscle that goes right under the lungs and curves around and is attached to the most inferior parts of the rib cage. And it is the border between the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity. So it's a thin, tough, dome-shaped muscle that separates those two cavities. Contraction expands the thoracic cavity. So think about it this way. Every time you take a deep breath, the diaphragm moves down. So imagine that my, my hands here, the diaphragm, when I go, the diaphragm moves down like that. And when I exhale, it moves back up. And it takes the pressure inside of here. And when you take that pressure, that gas pressure, and you increase the chamber size, it reduces pressure and that draws air in. It's part of the gas laws. Uh, if you get a reduction in pressure, it's going to move air outside. And then conversely, when you take that diaphragm and relax it so that you take the amount of air in the thoracic cavity and reduce it, that makes the pressure increase and that expels air out of that cavity. There's actually a really cool thing you can do with a water bottle. If you take a, like, uh, let's say a sports drink water bottle, not one of the, the thin water bottles, but one of the tougher ones, if you cut it halfway um, and take a balloon and stick the balloon on the inside of the opening to the water bottle and attach it, it would actually look like this. So here's the opening. Take a balloon, let's say it's this blue balloon, and put it on the inside here. And you take the lip that you would normally blow through and put it on the outside here. And then you take another balloon and cut it so that it's just enough surface area to attach to the bottom here, and you're gonna have to tape it to the bottom of the water uh, bottle, this cutoff water bottle. If you were to grab the bottom balloon part and pull on it, that's like the diaphragm. When you pull on the bottom, it's going to take the amount of air in here and it's gonna reduce the pressure because you still have the same amount of air in there, but now you've given it more space. And that pressure reduction is going to draw air in here and you will see the balloon expand. That's how your lungs work. And that's why I mentioned um, in the previous slide about the importance of, of the pleura and having that liquid layer. And if there was a leak in there, your lungs ability to expand and contract is gonna be significantly reduced and affected. So you can do this at home. It's a nice demo of, of how the lungs work. The intercostal muscles are another part of, of the breathing mechanism. So when I'm doing more shallow breathing, I'm not making as much of a dramatic contraction and relaxation in my diaphragm. There's also all the muscles in between the ribs of my thoracic cage. The contraction of those particular intercostal muscles is gonna elevate the ribs and the sternum so that my breastbone moves up and out and the ribs move up and out. And that's gonna further uh, increase uh, the, the space that's inside the thoracic cage and that reduces um, the pressure within here and, and draws air in. And the opposite happens when you exhale. Um, those intercostal muscles are going to relax, bring the rib cage back down and cause air to leave the lungs. So diaphragmatic uh, breathing and costal breathing, if, if I do take a really deep breath, you notice that there's much more of a, of a diaphragm effort there and more shallow breathing, kind of when you're just sitting there, not even thinking about breathing. Um, you know, you don't need to take deep breaths if you're just sitting there in a relaxed mode. Uh, you don't need to have that deep kind of breathing and they call that costal breathing because just moving your chest a little bit up and down is going to be enough uh, to get air in and out. 
Forced breathing is another story. So forced breathing is even more significant than this deep diaphragmatic breathing. Um, that could be due to stress, overexertion, um, hyperventilation could accompany this. So forced breathing is where your abdominal muscles and other accessory muscles are going to assist with getting air in and out. Abdominal muscles can, if they're acting in addition to the upper ones, they can force um, your diaphragm to do more dramatic contractions and relaxations. They're right next door to it. Um, so that forced breathing <gasps> is going to be something that is usually accompanied stress, um, some kind of problem um, in terms of the need to have that forced breathing, that really dramatic breathing. If you ever wondered what causes a hiccup, it has to do with the diaphragm. A hiccup is basically a um, very short inhalation. If this is the diaphragm, it's, 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 it's a spasm in the diaphragm. So normally when you breathe in, that's what the diaphragm does. But hiccup is, so what causes that spasm in the diaphragm? It's a lot of different things. Uh, eating too fast and, and sucking too much air as, as you're eating quickly uh, could irritate the diaphragm. Also, I, I've experienced this, you may have too, laughing a lot. Uh, could bring on hiccups. Um, the theory behind that is uh, a really intense laughing uh, is going to involve uh, quick contractions and relaxations of your abdominal muscles. And since your abdominal muscles are right next door to where the diaphragm is, uh, that could irritate the diaphragm and cause those uh, spasms to occur, which leads to hiccups. All right, when it comes to respiratory volumes, this describes the different levels of breathing in terms of how big of an inhalation are you taking, how big of an exhalation are you making. If we start over here, this line here, that's just called tidal volume. It's kind of like your regular breathing when you're just at rest. And I know on the y-axis here it says milliliters uh, per kilogram, but I think it's easier to think about just the total volume involved. For the average person, this is about half a liter, 500 milliliters. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to move my pen along here and show you what's involved. So here we go. So I'm taking inhalations and exhalations that are just very shallow here. Here comes a big one. and so on. So there you saw what happened, that I went way beyond that typical tidal volume inhalation and, and took in as much air as I could at that moment. And that's called inspiratory reserve volume. So your lungs can take a lot more air in than you normally do with this tidal volume, just 500 milliliters in, 500 milliliters out. And here I went another maybe close to a couple liters. And that's when you need it. So if you're taking a big breath because you're going to hold your breath um, or you're getting ready to do something, you're going to need to take a bigger breath there. And that's known as the inspiratory reserve volume, which is the amount of volume your lungs can go past that tidal volume. And then I exhaled so much, I, I even exhaled past that tidal volume level and try to exhale as much as I possibly could out of my lungs Below the tidal volume, they call this expiratory reserve volume. And it stops here instead of going all the way down to zero because you don't want to let every last bit of air out of your lungs or your lungs would collapse. Um, if you take all the air out of your lungs, there'd be no air pressure or gas pressure and it would cause the lungs to just deflate. And a collapsed lung is not good for breathing. So there's typically what's called residual volume um, it's, um, I think, a little less than a liter in the average person. So residual volume is the amount of air that tends to stay in your lungs. Now, if you get hit really hard, let's say in the abdominal area, that could um, cause someone, they say, oh, they've, they've lost their breath, they got the wind knocked out of them is another way for that to be expressed. Um, that could cause some of that residual volume to be expelled and the person's gonna have trouble breathing. Um, so it's good that residual volume is kept in your lungs so that your lungs don't collapse. Um, right here, this inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume, this should actually be phrased as uh, inspiratory capacity. So this is your um, total 
volume for the amount of inhalation uh, that you can take in, in terms of the amount of air. Uh, so inspiratory is like saying, um, you know, the, the quality of inhaling. So inhalation and inspiration, same thing. They're synonyms. All of this area below tidal volume, the amount of air that you can exhale below that, including the residual volume, that's called the functional residual capacity. So that's ERV plus RV. And then the total amount of air from the total max you could inhale to the total max you could typically exhale is called vital capacity. That's the range you have control over. Um, so it's a lot. And of course, you don't want to get rid of this. But if you add together the vital capacity and residual volume, that's the total volume of air uh, that you could possibly contain in your lungs. That's known as the total lung capacity. And of course, this is variable in terms of the precise measurements. I mentioned 500 milliliters uh, earlier for um, the tidal volume. In someone that's really petite, it'll be less. In someone that's really large and has really large lungs, it can be a bit more. Partial pressures of gases is what actually gets gas in and out of the alveolar sacs in your lungs and getting it into your lungs for that matter. The major atmospheric gases, if you look at the big four, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Nitrogen gas is about 78% of the atmosphere. Uh, oxygen gas is close to 21%. And the rest is these two and other ones that make up a tiny percentage of the atmosphere, like argon, etc. So partial pressures determine how much of each gas will flow into and out of liquid from the air. And it all comes down to diffusion. Yes, you are actively expanding the lungs and contracting them in terms of the muscles effect on expanding and contracting the lungs, but the movement of air in and out really comes down to diffusion. You're not using active transport or, or ATP uh, to drive oxygen in and to drive CO2 out. It's diffusion, which is that passive natural process. So that's why it comes down to pressures. If the pressure is higher here, then here, the gas is going to go that way. And that just comes down to gas laws. It's going to drive uh, gas to where there's less pressure. And of course, altitude can have a dramatic effect on pressure. The reason why some people get short of breath when they go high up in the altitude is because if you look at the uh, atmospheric pressure and, and partial pressures of gases at sea level, there's a lot more oxygen in terms of the uh, pressure and the amount of oxygen that's in the atmosphere at sea level. You go up, let's say, uh, 2,000 meters, 4,000 meters, you're going up really high in the mountains, there's a lot less gas, specifically oxygen gas. So the partial pressure of oxygen at that altitude, much less. So the amount of oxygen that is then going into the liquid layers of the alveoli is going to be less. So people end up having to take more inhalations to accommodate and to get that oxygen in there. Um, and that can lead to, uh, like I was just explaining, shortness of breath, um, lightheadedness. People are more likely to pass out from having less oxygen entering their lungs. Um, so altitude, definitely a player uh, that makes sense in terms of partial pressures. Oxygen, the reason why it moves out of uh, alveoli, and, and I mean out of meaning once oxygen comes into the, the bottom parts of the respiratory tree, it moves out of alveoli into your bloodstream is because if you look at the amount of oxygen in the capillaries that are going up into the uh, alveolar bundles, the pressure, partial pressure of oxygen is greater in the alveolar sac than it is in the capillary. And that's why oxygen goes into the capillary. Conversely, it's opposite when you look at CO2. Um, if this is an alveolar bundle, and here's the capillary going right next to it, and here's another capillary going right next to it. CO2 pressure is going to be lower in the alveolus than it is in the capillary. So in the capillary, CO2 pressure is greater because 
CO2 is that waste product you get from the cells doing aerobic respiration. You want it to go back to the lungs. So your capillaries are taking it back into here. And because of the fact that the partial pressure of CO2 is greater in your capillary than it is in here, the CO2 is going to make its way from the capillaries into the alveolus, allowing you to exhale it. And it's the opposite flow with oxygen because the partial pressure is flipped with that gas. If you look at this particular um, uh, graph here, it shows you in the different parts of the atmosphere and in the body how the partial pressures work. Notice with nitrogen, it's almost the same throughout. In the atmosphere, the partial pressure of nitrogen a little greater than within the body. It doesn't change much in the body. Nitrogen is such a major part of uh, the gas that we inhale and a major part of the gas that's found in the bloodstream. That's not going to change that much. But when you look at oxygen, look at the percentage in terms of the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere and how it gradually gets lower. Um, the partial pressure of oxygen can only drive it so far deep within the body. So it does get to our cells, but the relative amount of oxygen that's in the cells of our body compared with the amount that's in the atmosphere it's significantly less. Um, the alveolar gas, this is the gas that's actually in the alveoli. Here's the partial pressures in arterial blood, uh, taking that blood to the body out of the heart. Uh, and then venous blood, this is the blood going back to the heart. And like I mentioned earlier, this is uh, partial pressures within cells. And finally, some respiratory conditions and disorders. Asthma is chronic bronchoconstriction. So the bronchioles uh, in the lungs, if you have problems expanding them, that can lead to asthma. And, and the thing is, asthma attacks happen when somebody who has that um, slightly more constricted bronchial set, they do physical exertion. They, they, let's say they're playing in a soccer game or playing a softball game, what have you. And the need to get more air into their body because their heart's beating faster and they're doing more with their muscles, that's when the asthma attack can happen. And it's not just because of physical exertion, uh, stress can bring on an asthma attack. So the treatment for asthma, because there currently is no cure, um, is bronchodilators. So the inhalers that people use uh, when, when they have asthma or when they get an asthma attack, those inhalers, they chemically cause a dilation of the bronchioles to get more air uh, into the respiratory tree and they get relief from that. Um, one treatment for asthma that I've heard works for some people is somebody who lives in a very urban area where the air quality is poor. Maybe they live next to factories, they live to next to where a lot of cars are with, with the exhaust coming out of their pipes. If they move to a more rural area to the countryside, the air quality is a little bit better, and that can actually have a positive effect on some people with asthma. Their symptoms are reduced oftentimes when they do that. Uh, emphysema is the gradual deterioration of the alveolar bundles in the lungs. If those little sacs get damaged and there are more spaces in the lungs, the ability to adequately get air into your bloodstream with each breath is reduced. Emphysema happens because of smoking, because of inhaling smoke, um, usually it's, it's trauma that's going to cause that or smoke. But over time, um, as a person gets older, you're more likely to experience symptoms of emphysema. So in, in elderly people, emphysema tends to gradually happen, at least minor symptoms, even if they never smoked. So that inevitable damage that happens over the years to lung tissue um, is, is just more common the older you get. Lung cancer is when you get the development of uh, tumors in the lungs. So emphysema can lead to lung cancer if the emphysema is bad enough. And lung cancer uh, is, of course, more likely to happen if you are a smoker. But even people who've never smoked a day in their life can get lung cancer. Um, and lung cancer, like many cancers, has the ability to spread to other parts of the body, especially because there's so much blood flow in the lungs and lymphatic tissue um, that you find all throughout the body. And so the spreading of lung cancer to other organs um, is, is what's going to tend to um, kill a person. Laryngitis and bronchitis, uh, those are irritations or infections of the larynx and uh, the bronchioles. Laryngitis, an infection of the larynx, 
is going to make your voice sound like this because your voice box, your vocal folds and vocal cords are in the larynx. So infection of that um, can definitely have an, uh, an effect on your voice or make you lose your voice entirely. And then bronchitis is an infection a little bit further down in the lower respiratory tract. Uh, and that's going to usually be accompanied with coughing. Uh, the thing with sneezing and coughing is sneezing tends to be irritation in the upper respiratory tract. So getting dust or uh, particles into the nasal region, into the throat region, <laughs> is going to be, <laughs> you know, causing you to have that sneeze. And in case you didn't know, sneezes happen at over 100 miles per hour. Um, that's pretty fast. Uh, bronchitis or, you know, getting uh, deeper irritations, uh, production of mucus, excessive production of mucus or irritation in the lower respiratory tract is going to cause coughing. You know, and that's your body's natural ability to try to get that stuff out. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. Um, if you took genetics and biology, it's um, uh, autosomal recessive. And cystic fibrosis is when you have a, pro a problem uh, with a certain kind of protein channel in your cells that's supposed to shuttle along an ion. Um, if you are not able to do that, the accumulation of those ions, of those, of those charged atoms, tends to attract water because of osmosis. And cystic fibrosis leads to um, production of excess mucus or, or collection of excess mucus in organs like the pancreas and the lungs. So cystic fibrosis does affect um, the lungs. Um, it's one of the, the main places that you get the, uh, the negative consequences of cystic fibrosis. There is no cure, um, but there are treatments for this disease. Decompression sickness, also called the bends, tends to happen because of dramatic altitude changes or, more commonly, if a scuba diver has dove really deep and they come up way too quickly to the surface, because they were down low and they had a highly compressed um, oxygen tank, uh, getting oxygen to the lungs, if they don't go up gradually and adjust the pressure and let their body reacclimate, going up way too fast to the surface is going to cause a dramatic accumulation of nitrogen gas in parts of their bloodstream. And it, uh, it can kill a person. And it can be very painful in terms of uh, the accumulation of nitrogen gas in the joints. So if you do have somebody who gets decompression sickness or the bends, you want to take them to um, a hospital nearby where they're going to have um, a hyperbaric chamber, and, and that can uh, cure the bends. Um, and some people, it, it just happens too quickly and too dramatically, so it can result in death. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection of the lungs caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, that you don't see as much in, in first world countries and industrialized nations uh, anymore, but it does happen occasionally. And when this bacteria gets into the lungs and goes through a binary fission, the bacteria divides and, and moves around the lungs, you can get the development of these things called tubercules, these little sacs of bacteria. And as they grow and as these um, the bacterial colonies continue to grow, the, t the tubercules, uh, they can break and cause bleeding, cause massive uh, lung bleeding, and that's why the coughing up of blood is associated with tuberculosis, and it used to be called the Red Death. Uh, so if you don't get the treatment with antibiotics early on, um, it, it can lead to death. Uh, there's a test they do where they uh, make a little injection in your forearm, and there's a little puffy bump, and you go back a couple of days later, and if the bump's gone away, that means that you don't have antibodies to tuberculosis, you've never been exposed to it, means you're not sick with it. If that bump does not go away, it means you've been exposed to TB, you've been exposed to tuberculosis, that particular bacterium. Just because you've been exposed to it and it's gone into your body, it doesn't mean you have the infection to see if they actually have the tuberculosis colonies in their uh, lungs, they do a chest x-ray. And that chest x-ray will reveal whether or not you have those little tubercules, uh, those little uh, sacs. And they appear in an x-ray, and, and if you have them, that means you are sick with uh, tuberculosis. SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Um, this kills thousands of babies per year in the United States alone. Um, all the answers with, with SIDS are not known, but what they do think is that um, the way you place your baby in the crib can have an effect on whether or not SIDS can happen, uh, but it's not foolproof. Uh, 
Um, so SIDS, um, it typically happens when the baby has gone to sleep, um, they stop breathing, turn blue, and, um, and pass away. They think that one of the parts of the brain in, in babies that has to do with it is early on in, in that infant's life, the respiratory centers associated with the medulla oblongata and the lower parts of the brain are still establishing themselves with, with how they connect to other parts of the cerebrum and other parts of the brain. And that might have something to do with it. Um, so if you do have an infant child, talk to the pediatrician about how to um, maximize the chances that the baby will not die from SIDS. Pneumonia. Pneumonia is, uh, it could be viral, but it's typically a bacterial infection that causes um, production of lots of mucus uh, at, at the base of the lungs where you have uh, those bronchioles and, and alveolar bundles. And pneumonia uh, can be fatal. Uh, it can be cured, but it, it does lead to, the, to death of some people. Um, it, it's going to tend to kill somebody who is much older, who has been a chronic smoker, because like I mentioned earlier in the lesson, people who smoke a lot tend to damage the cilia that are meant to sweep up the excess mucus so that you don't drown in your own fluids produced down there. Um, so pneumonia uh, has to do with basically drowning uh, in fluids within the lungs, um, but it can be cured. A pneumothorax, like I mentioned earlier, is getting um, uh, a, a leakage of air into the space between the pleura, and air leaking in there can collapse a lung, and that can be fatal as well. Carbon monoxide poisoning, or CO poisoning, unlike CO2, carbon monoxide is just CO. And carbon monoxide, if you look at how it attaches to the heme group, um, the hemoglobin molecule on red blood cells, is meant to attach oxygen, right? You want oxygen to be carried by heme on hemoglobin because red blood cells are like little oxygen raft. But when you look at the affinity for CO, carbon monoxide, with respect to heme, it's like more of a magnet. Um, carbon monoxide will attach to heme much more efficiently than oxygen gas. So if there is a carbon monoxide leak in someone's house, um, it's because maybe there's a gas leak uh, in, in one of their uh, gas appliances, uh, an oven, whatever. If all the windows are closed and uh, there's no way for the air to leave a room, the buildup of carbon monoxide can gradually kill a person. Carbon monoxide is odorless, tasteless, colorless, um, sometimes a carbon monoxide leak will be associated with a leak of a chemical that does have a smell. It's called beta mercaptan, but, uh, you know, fire departments especially, they recommend that everyone gets a carbon monoxide detector in their house. And it's, it's not very expensive. You just plug it into one of your outlets. And if there is enough carbon monoxide in the air, the alarm will go off. And that means get out of your house immediately, call 911. Uh, so it's recommended you get a carbon monoxide detector, it can save lives.